Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Bryson Nelson of Nelson Drum Shop. Bryson, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So this is a bit of a different episode than, you know, a, a typical like the history of blank, because um, I think you have a very neat, um, I don't know, just a persona and just a vibe that you have created for your shop, uh, both in person and on social media, which is very important now, as we know. Um, so uh, good work, I should just say up front. I think oh, you've done a good job you. for a young guy to create such a, a, a really a nationally, internationally known brand. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's very kind. Yeah. So you're a young guy. How old are you? If you don't mind me asking, you're a pretty young guy. I, I just turned 30. In okay. May, so, yep. Nice. Well, I'm 31. So we're right around the, um, the same age and we both are, uh, in the trenches with young, uh, <laughs> young, young boys, Yep. <laughs> which is absolute insanity. So, um, why don't you tell us about you as a, in your background in drumming? Sure. Sure. Um, I start, I mean, I've been playing drums since I was probably 12 years old. Um, I was homeschooled all the way up till high school. So I just spent every hour of every day kind of playing and it became my biggest passion really quickly. Uh, I grew up in a pretty small town, so honestly, there wasn't just really a lot to do. So that kind of became like my, my love in a lot of ways. But so I started playing then. And then when I was 17 years old, I got asked to do my very first tour which was a really bizarre thing because being in a small town, there just wasn't a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, and this call just kind of magically happened. It was actually through my uncle, which knew a musician uh, in LA and he needed a drummer. Uh, and so it, this, this gig wasn't a great paying gig or anything, but it was like my first opportunity that got me to move um, about a year later to Orange County, San Diego, LA area. I kind of lived all over, um, all over that place. But Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I started touring when I was like 17, and that was my full-time job up until I started the shop. And um, the shop wasn't really a super intentional thing for me. I wasn't trying to start a drum shop. I, to be honest, I, I never thought about doing retail. I never had any dreams of doing retail. Um, I loved a shop in Portland called Revival Drum Shop, and they've mm -hmm. always been my... like I've, I've loved those people. They've always been very kind to me, and I just loved the way I felt when I would go there. But even then, I, I never wanted a drum shop. It wasn't something I was trying to do. I just, I loved how that place made me feel. And it was always a great spot for me when I was on tour. But my dream was always to be a studio musician. I, 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 I definitely am, um, I love people more than anything on the planet, but I'm, I'm very much a hermit. I, I like, I kind of, you know, do my little things or whatever. So I never really hustled the music thing very strong. Um, I just like, when I got work, I would take it. And it somehow just always paid my bills, which I felt very thankful that I could yeah. do that. Um, but it was never anything crazy. I never, um, was on like, um, you know, crazy amount of tours or massive tours or anything like that. It was a pretty modest career. People I played for were very kind, but, um, anyway, so that, that kind of led into, uh, the shop organically. I, I just, all my favorite drummers played old gear, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, all my, all the classics like Elvin or, uh, uh, Papa Joe or whoever, um, yeah. or Jay Belleros or any of these guys I looked up to, they all played old vintage gear and I just thought it was really cool. So I, I started just buying stuff because I loved it for different records. You know, every once in a while I get a studio session and it was always the time I would try to buy another piece of gear just to feel creative or, or feel like it'd give me some type of inspiration to play differently yeah. or, you know, try something out. So, and it's just fun to buy gear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. So anyway, that kind of just turned into, uh, I, I piled up uh, this whole big collection of gear. Whenever I got a paycheck from a gig, I would like go out and buy another piece to inspire me to play something new or whatever. And, um, and then when I moved to Tennessee, I, I, this was, uh, I think when I was 25, I moved 24. Um, I, I did about, nine, 10 years touring at that point. And I really, I really wanted to get off the road and pursue my studio thing. But I, I definitely, and this is not me just trying to be humble necessarily, but I, I'm definitely not a great enough drummer to be a full-time studio drummer by any means. But I was like, I'll, uh, I'll just do my best and get as much work as I can. And maybe I'll have a side hustle to kind of support that. Cause that's really what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so when I moved here, uh, I just had all these drums with me and I just started selling stuff, um, on the side to, I gave it a name I, at the time it was Nelson drum co and it was just out of my garage. 
in Franklin, Tennessee. I lived there for like two years and, um, and I was just selling stuff to buy more stuff for studio. And it was also a way for me, I really love community and, and friendship. And so, I mean, more, way more than the drums, you know, but, uh, so it was just another really an honest way for me to make friends and, um, and try to build some type of community around this little place. Uh, and that was, that was way before retail. That was, you know, two years of doing that in my house or three years before I went into retail. Would that just be like Craigslist and Facebook and stuff like that at that point? I made a little Instagram page. It's the oh, same I one I use now. Sure. But it, was, it was just very modest. I wasn't like trying to push a shop. It was just very much, um, I was just trying to connect musicians and, uh, and honestly make friends and through that kind of sheer ge- gear with each other for whatever work to inspire us. And that slowly organically turned more and more into a shop and other people were telling me like, Oh, you need to, you need to start a shop. You need to do a retail shop. You know, like you have all this cool stuff and it's a cool vibe. And I was like, no, no, that's just, that's not really me. Like I'm not a salesy business guy at all. Like I, I don't have that like one bone in my body that is that way, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? And I, yeah. I've always been a little bit more of a, I guess more of an artistic thinker in that sense where like running a business, like there's no way I thought I'd be able to do something like that. You know, like the way that I thought you needed to look to run a business. I'm like, that's just not me. There's no way I could pull that off. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it, it just kind of slowly organically turned into it. Um, and after that, like two years of kind of doing it in Franklin, it became more and more in my full-time gig where selling these drums was really paying my mortgage. You know, it wasn't gigs as much anymore. And and at that point, like when I moved to Tennessee, I really wanted to get off the road. Um, me and my wife were pretty newly married and I just realized I didn't like to be away from her that long. Yeah. Um, and I love touring. I, it's never been a, a thing that I, I didn't like. I, I've always loved touring, but I think most of my tours were um, like six to eight weeks long, which was just hard. I would just start to miss my wife a lot. So um, yeah, so that was, that was a part of me kind of stepping away from tours when I moved to to Tennessee and that slowly organically just kind of turned into a shop with me flipping drums and trying to do studio stuff. Um, mm. I never tried to push the studio thing very strong and um, I just love to play. I, I never really even wanted to like be a super successful studio drummer or whatever. I just, I just really loved playing on record. So I was like, yeah. even if I do this twice a year, it's so fulfilling to me. I just love to create music. Yeah. And that's um, a tough market there because that's so, saturated with unbelievable drummers that you know it's um it's kind of makes sense that you um just for the love of drums do some session stuff but to keep in the world of drums it just makes sense to have a shop and work on sharing that love of gear as well yeah, kind of fits totally. together yeah totally I, I think over time I and mean, this was several years ago over this last several years it's became way more my passion um even more than playing and the part that I loved about playing was always uh, was always the people. I'm like uh, to to a fault. I I just I um, live my whole life around people. So uh, I mean that's probably the good and the bad yeah. thing about me, I guess. But anyway, um, so with the shop, I, I started to realize like, man, this is cool. People are coming in and they're they're making friends, and uh, it's a place that people feel like welcome, and people feel accepted here. And that to me was extremely fulfilling um and so i think over time my passion grew more and more like i do want to have a retail shop like i actually like this way more than i liked playing on records you know the very few records i did play on um this was something i even enjoyed more so and i I just did not see that coming at all so it was very organic and uh pure to me in a lot of ways because i I didn't really have any motives to start a uh, a drum shop, you know, like even when I think about it, sometimes it still feels funny to me. Cause I'm like, I, I, I shouldn't, I'm not the guy to run a business at all. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting <laughs> you know? too. Cause I, I almost think it's like, um, I think maybe other people think this too, where it's like from a guy who doesn't, uh, I'm, I'm like, I, I mean, I started a sole proprietorship for like video and audio stuff before I worked at a studio. And like, even that was like, um, it's just confused. Like business stuff can be very daunting and i mean i can't even imagine starting a brick and mortar shop and i mean i'm talking like taxes and payroll for because you have employees and all this stuff i mean when it started was it were you kind of freaking out or was it more just like um this is you know let's take it a day at a time and um figure it out as you go did you make any and 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 on that note did you make any like fumbles that you kind of wish that you would have known early on about 
certain <laughs> like, oh, electric is expensive for these businesses. You know what I mean? Any Anything that you learned along the way? Oh, totally. That's a good question. Um, yeah, when I went into it, I was I was pretty scared. I mean, my rent was so cheap. Um, I I approached another shop in town. They weren't retail at the time, but there's a shop called Drum Supply, and um, I met him through another friend. And uh, I thought he was a really nice guy, so I, I approached him. I was like, "Hey, I have this dream to open up a little shop, and I just want to give it a try. Like, this is a new dream of mine. I, this is kind of my vision for it." Blah blah blah. And he's never done retail at the time. He was a uh, more of like a warehouse uh, um, repair. He had a repair guy that works for him. He, he would offer repairs to the community, which is a really cool service. Um, so anyway, when I approached him, he really liked the idea and we kind of went for it. And at the time, um, my rent looked so scary to me. I, it was very cheap. It was like 800 bucks a month, Yeah, you know, just for this tiny, tiny little space in his shop, um, just a corner really. Uh, and so I started out of that and it was really freaking me. I had no employees at all. It was just me working 24 seven. And I mean like literally 24 seven, you know, I'd yeah. get there three hours before we opened and I would stay like three, four hours after we closed every day um, just to like fulfill shipments. You know, I was doing all that myself. So if there was something I was ordered online, which I, that's kind of how I started my shop was through the more honestly through like our Instagram page mm-hmm. um, yeah. out of my house. I just started bringing friends in to do videos and it was just a way to like make friends and build community. And that kind of slowly turned into this. So I had a little bit, not, not a big online audience, but I had a little bit of an online audience that was already buying. So I, I feel like going into this, I have a little bit of supplementary income that could that could help. But uh, but it was still very scary. Like I was just doing everything possible completely by myself, and I had no no room for employees or no budget for employees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I did that for you know probably like a year and a half. And my very first employee, um, his name's Lucas Aldridge. He still works for me. That was probably a year, year and a half into it. And before that, the whole time, he was kind of helping out on off days from work just as a friend would just kind of come over and, and help on whatever, help package things, help clean up drums or whatever it was. Yeah. And, and that's John's That's John's son, right? Yeah, that's uh, John Aldrich's son. So yeah. he grew up restoring a lot of John's drums when he was young, and he was just always around it. So he, he, he was helping me run the retail thing for a whole year, just him. And he didn't really like working with customers as much. He's, he's, uh, Lucas is one of the most kindest people we ever meet, but he, he very much, um, preferred kind of working solo with just restoring drums and not really doing the whole checkout and the hustle of retail. So he became like my full, my full time, uh, restoration guy and still is. And like, in that time it was very like a job here, a job there. And now he's like, you know, every single day he's working on another drum. that's just crazy backed up all the time, which is great. So he's really kind of made it out to be a fun job for himself. Um, yeah, and, and he's a vintage drum on Instagram, which great yeah. name cuts yeah. right to the point. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. I, yeah, that's, that's great to have a guy. I mean, so you're, you're like, I don't know. It seems like pretty quickly you learned that like you can't do everything yourself and um, you have to partner up with people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I like, I just like it that way more too. I really like working with people. Um, it's just everything is more fun that way. So at totally. this point, like, I mean, this is now my, I'm moving into my third location. Um, the second location I moved into was a, a pretty big dramatic uh, increase in rent too. Like I went from like 700 a month and I got a little bit more space from him to, sorry to answer this question from earlier, uh, yeah. a little bit more space from him uh, where it was $1,200 a month. And then it went from that to my next location, which was like 3000 a month. And for Man. me, that, that was, that was definitely the scariest leap I've had going from Andy's spot with a tiny little space, like this much bigger retail space that was like six times the size um, or even more than that probably. And then to to have that much overhead. And then at that point I had, I think three employees when I moved into that one of them, that which was full time, his name's Asa Lane. He, he was the manager of my shop for uh, a couple of years, really wonderful human being. But anyway, he, uh, he worked it and I had a Lemuel, which now is the manager of my shop and he's fantastic. He, he runs that place way better than I ever could. He's just so on top of it. And logistically, he's really quite incredible. But anyway, so them and then Lucas, they, they yeah. moved with me to that spot. So I had to then pay their paycheck and then also this sure. new rent, which was a, which was scary. That was very scary. And then I'm, I'm kind of now, I know this is, I tend to over explain. <laughs> no, I love it, man. I'm, <laughs> but, uh, I'm, it's, it's real. This is real stuff. Oh, good, good. Um, and then from there, so like now I'm going into a, another new change and, this is my, my dream building, the one that we landed. And it, it was just my personal mechanic. 
and I was friends with him. Um, we like through me bringing in his car, we just became friends. He's a really honest man. It was a really good mechanic. Um, and he, he kind of talked about slowly retiring for like that three years that I was bringing my car there. And then I brought it up to him, like towards the end, he kept talking about like, Oh, you know, I think I'm coming up to being done here soon. And I'm like, well, this is like my, I, I told him before that, that time I've told him, uh, it was my dream spot over that couple of years and how much I love his space and how cool it is. And, um, and when he talked more seriously about retiring, I, I was like, man, I would really love to rent this, um, if possible or see if I could try to buy it. And he's like, Oh, okay. Okay. And then he called me several months later. He's like, okay, I think I'll do it. Like I, I would be happy to rent this to you or wow. if you could afford to buy it. And so he put it up for sale and I, I just, I was so unaware. <laughs> <laughs> he put it up for a, I thought it'd be like, you know, maybe five, $600,000, which is a lot of money. Um, yeah. But I was thinking it'd be like that. And he put it up in his $1.4 million oh for this building. God. And it needed everything done in the books. Like it didn't have insulation, doesn't have AC, like it needed a bunch of work. It's just like this old rundown gas station. That's really, really cool. And has this yeah. nice parking lot. But East Nashville has just grown so fast, so quickly that like it's anything here is just a fortune now it's crazy but yeah so he put it up and i was like oh man oh i can't afford it so i called him back and i was like i you know it's my dream spot but i i just there's no way in the world i can afford that um hmm. and so he put it up for sale he got three offers for full price oh, and God. Uh, you know over like a month of having it up he called me back at the end of it he's like hey I turned down all these offers um he's like i don't think i'm ready to get rid of it it was his dad's building so he's like i don't think i'm really ready to get rid of this building yet so i think i'll i'll rent it to you for five years you know just and then also prices are going up so much so in five years from now if somebody fixes up the building for him he'll be able to sell it for even more so it's kind of a win-win um and so anyway he he told me he'd rent it to me and at the time it was four thousand dollars a month and i was like oh my gosh that's an incredible deal for this building like that's that's unreal for this location and this amount of parking like that, that type of deal doesn't happen in yeah. East Nashville, even though it's a lot of money. That's like for East Nashville specifically for sure. building like that, it should be double or more, you know? Um, yeah. And so I felt so lucky. And then he had a, there's a really famous coffee shop in town that got a hold that he was, you know, running it. I don't know how they found out, but they found out that he was open running the place and they offered him 7.5, uh, thousand a month wow and, and they're like and we'll put in like 250 300 thousand dollars and renovate in this place and make it a new parking lot all this stuff and i was like oh gosh i can't compete with that like that's that's so money i'll never see you know and it's just like and it's also like just very different types of businesses there's yeah. like a big profit business mine is more my business I, I even the word business for me is is tough but i like mine i just wanted to be a community space i'm like man to sure. pay that type of rent how am i going to do something like that off these low margin uh things but anyway so uh it was quite amazing. He, he told me that this guy gave him this offer and he's like, you know what, but I didn't, I just didn't really get the best read on what he wanted to do with the business. So he's like, I, I'm going to rent it to you. He's like, I can't rent it for four because of this offer. But he's like, if you could come up and do 5.5 and then it'll bounce up to six basically over that five years. Wow. Yeah. He's like, then it's yours. Um, and so that was really scary to me because I've never gone into an investment like that with the shop and, at this point, I have several full-time employees that bring up a really large bill as well. Yeah. And they, they're amazing. They're in, you know worth every penny and more. But um, so yeah, that that was definitely pretty scary. But I'm I'm just going for it. You know, like I Yeah. I'm just I, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense financially. Um I mean, business is doing great. It's not that I don't think the business can necessarily handle it. it, it uh, no, but you're a smart guy where you are you don't want to over reach and put yourself in a bad position where you're then stressing it. You want to have comfortable margins, but, um, but like, I don't know. It, it, I think having a cool location like that and those garage kind of like, uh, you know, with the doors are so cool. There's, there's a lot of them here in Northern Kentucky. I'm in Cincinnati, but across the river, you know, 20 minutes away is Northern Kentucky. And there's, um, a lot of them there. And I used to work as a photo assistant and we were in Tennessee, I believe right outside of Nashville um, at, at for a guy who made like, you know, kind of custom uh, bespoke jeans, like high end uh, raw denim jeans or whatever. And while we were there, I remember we went to Imogene and Willie, which is a jean place where I looked at it. And I was like, oh, my God, these are two hundred dollars. I'll order 
Levi's off Macy's.com or something. Sure, sure. <laughs> but um, it was similar Same. where it was like, wow, this is cool. It was like a sh- It was like, you know, a garage and it opened. And I think part of the draw of like wanting to go there is because it's such an awesome location. So I think, oh, thank you. You, you know, I think you're on the right move because I think um, people want to go to this cool location and that's part of the community. So you got to you got to spend money to make money, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it definitely, I, I would be lying if I said it wasn't scary, but it's, um, but I, but I do think it'll work out. And this community has been really unbelievably supportive to us. Um, it's been really quite amazing. Uh, but anyway, um, no, we're, we're all very excited about it and I do think it'll, it'll work out quite great. It's just, um, it is what's, a leap for sure. What's the timeline? Cause you know, this will come out and then be up forever. So what's the timeline? Um, of the move because right now today it's september 27th 2021 what's your timeline mm-hmm. looking like oh it's it's coming around the corner very quick um so it's a we're, we just decided i i have until october 15th in my current lease um and that 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 timeline was honestly too quick with how much we need to get done with this building like i i still have to we still have to put in an ac hvac unit um i still have to build out two rooms um and then I have to do a bunch of yard work and different things to kind of make it look sure. nice. But, but the amount of stuff that is there to do, like, especially at the, I'm working with like me and a couple of friends, it's, it's a, it's quite a bit of stuff for such a small window, but yeah. Um, but we're just doing our best and crossing our fingers and we're, we're pushing for October 18th. Um, wow. So we're going to, uh, originally I was going to do like this big opening and ask a bunch of close friends. Um, I was going to fly a couple of drummers out from LA that I'm close buds with and a couple of buddies in town that we're going to play and a couple of singer songwriters and make this really big grand opening event. And I think just with how much I need to do with the build out it, um, I was like, I really need to condense this just for my stress level. Like I, I can't, I can't do all this, yeah. you know, event I, planning. I tend to like, I tend to over dream in that way too, which, which is good. It's but like good. I, I tend to like have this big dream and I'm like, okay, I'm going to reach out to all these friends and uh, figure out a way to do this. And I think just with how much there was, I didn't really, uh, you know, factor that in that, yeah. gosh, like there's, there's a lot to do with this building. I, I need to kind of shave some of this off. So anyway, yeah. I, I've kind of condensed it down. Um, and now uh, one of my closest friends, um, and I feel so very thankful for this. He's just been a, really an amazing help with my business, but, um, but my friend Jay Belarus is flying out, uh, the day after. So the, the 18th we're opening, which is doing a soft opening. will do things kind of as normal. And then the following day, uh, Jay's flying out with Molly Miller and his wife, Jen. Um, and the three then do like a little trio, uh, which is, which is great. And Jay was like, Jay was my favorite drummer that was, um, still living, you know, yeah. Since I was a kid, you know, so, and he's became a very, very dear friend. We talk every week and he's been amazing, but, uh, Man. Anyway, um, so he's coming out really just to help. And Jay, you know, he's, he's pretty amazing. He's trying to refuse to not let me pay him for this event or anything. And last time we did, we did an event about two years ago and he ended up, uh, I raised all this money for it and I tried to give it to him at the end of the show. And, and he's like, no, man, I want you to keep that. He's like, I'm paying all the musicians here. Like, I just really believe in what you're doing. And That's so he's awesome. that type of man, which is like, it's been pretty incredible to like, uh, to meet friends like that, that are just, you know, yeah, that's, spreading that type of influence is really a beautiful thing. That's what you want to hear. You don't want to hear, um, bad things about anyone. I mean, that's oh, for totally. someone who's such a great drummer and, and, and all that. It's just really cool to hear that. And one thing that I I'm thinking in the back of my head too, though, is like, um, and I kind of, I, I run into this with the podcast where I, I'm like, okay, I need to do this and I want to keep expanding and getting different advertising and do this. But it's like it, in, in your world, all this stuff you're doing, but the flow of drums, your sole purpose as a business really is a drum shop. I mean, beyond that community, you know what I mean? But the core yeah, of it yeah, is of to literally uh-huh. buy, sell, fix, you know, everything, drums, accessories, all this. So you need to keep that going as well. So that's totally that's that's a thing. You know, you're you're spinning plates here. So um is that something that you typically, you know, as your, you know, boots on the ground, you're out there hunting for drums, or is that typically what you're, you have employees and all this help doing with that as well? Um, so when I started, I, I definitely found every single drum that came into my shop, and every once in a while we get the 
the you know one consignment here, two consignments there, just through the local community. But originally, when I started my shop, I literally was hunting down. Even when I started retail, I was hunting down. You know, ninety five percent, ninety percent of everything that came in. And I think the more uh, established the shop got in town, and the more people that kind of found out about it. Um, now, ninety percent of everything that we get comes to us. A lot of it is uh, people emailing us. You know, th- through wherever, like if they live in Pennsylvania or California or or whatever, and they'll say, "Hey, I have this gear." Is it something that you would be interested in buying? And then we'll just kind of pick through and be like, oh, yeah, well, we would love to buy that. And, you know, maybe not this piece, but um, and then that's majority of how that's majority of our inventory. Now, I, I, I don't really buy a lot of individual drums anymore. OK, um, just with time. It's it's a lot of my job titles kind of changed a little bit over the last year or two. I'm kind of more overseeing and help with like creative vision and that sure. type of thing, which is really what I'm a little bit more passionate about than like the logistics of running a business. But so my, my employees definitely, they do a little bit of scouting, um, but uh, but I, I do buy a, a lot of uh, bulk as well. Like um, every once in a while, you know, maybe every like two months, I'll buy a big bulk amount of drums for a certain collector. And there's probably like seven, 10 different collectors that I work with that cool. I buy kind of in bulk from. So every couple of weeks, like they'll, they'll be texting me back and forth and say, hey, I have all this stuff. Um, what do you want to buy? We'll just go through it over text and phone calls and then they'll schedule a time where they'll bring a big trailer full of stuff and they'll dump it off. Hmm. So I've, I've kind of worked in those too, um, which has been a lot of fun. That's that, again, I know that sounds silly, but that's honestly kind of another way for me to continue friendships with a lot of these people too. It's just a fun way of doing business versus the, the scouting thing is, is fun. I like the hunt of drums. Um, yeah, but you can't, it just goes with what you said before about the, the, um, I don't know the pressure of the business. You you can't be like out every day hunting to find one like uh, Dynasonic or something. You oh, know what totally. I mean? Totally. Yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to survive. I no. mean, at, at this point, in the beginning, definitely. But at this point, we just we have to move so much a month to to really cover our expenses. So um, so we, yeah, we've I think we're and we're all learning. Like I'm I'm not an expert at this by any means, and my employees are learning too. Like we're just kind of learning. Um, with each step, like of each step of growth with our business, we're learning kind of how to figure out how to make it still work as a vintage drum shop. You know, yeah, it's, it's definitely not easy. Um, and there's only so many vintage drums, you know, like it's, we can't like go through a catalog and just pick this, 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 and this. And we are, we yeah. are expanding over time. Like when I, when I first started, it was just only vintage drums. That's all we had. We only had vintage symbols and then that kind of, and some vintage percussion and so forth. And that, that turned into, um, more of a i don't want to say traditional shop but i mean our shop is still primarily a vintage drum shop um but you know 80 percent of it probably is but then we're starting to branch out and carry normal things like sticks and heads and stuff that we never really ever carried before yeah but it's why not yeah so we're starting to branch out a little bit more and we we carry quite a few different boutique stuff and we've done that since the beginning too i forgot to mention that like we've there is a handful of modern things that we do carry but a lot of it is more like small builders and boutique makers and craftsmen um and we've we've carried that stuff since the beginning you know we're just as passionate about kind of that field of work so. yeah like i see like on you guys like c and c and brands like that where um i feel like there's certain things where that's the reason you don't go to like a guitar center or something it's because you find stuff that um you might not find um anywhere else but so have you found that uh shop nashville is a pretty you know it's a music city there are other drum shops. Um, uh, one big one that I'm thinking of right off the bat that's been there for a long time. Have mm-hmm. you found that the shop to shop community is pretty um, friendly and tight, or is there some competition? Because I mean, I'm on. I'm I and a lot of the listeners are on the outside of the the shop. Um, you know, community like owners uh-huh. is is it really competitive, or are you guys all pretty friendly? Um, that's, that's a really good question. I am, I am probably the least competitive person you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I was like, for instance, like when I was young, my mom tried to put me in sports and this is silly and cheesy, but I was the kid that was like running and picking her flowers versus, uh, <laughs> versus actually trying to play. Yeah. It was, it was like, like a baseball glove through. on your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, or, you know, we're just like doing whatever, like, cartwheels or you know sure. i just i just didn't care like who won and um and i think that that's kind of stayed with me my whole life i 
I, I have a very different vision, like I said, for my shop. So competing to me has never felt like, oh, I'm competing to sell the most drums or I'm competing to have like the biggest name in town. That, that type of stuff just didn't feel genuine to why I started my shop. So for my thing, it's like, man, how many people feel accepted here? How many people feel uh, like they can meet friends here or they feel inspired by uh, different pieces of uh, music you're here that like, helps them with whatever record or inspires them in some way or brings some type of joy to their life. Like that's way more important to me than just like trying to, you know, flatter my own ego of like, Oh, we're, we sell more drums than anybody in town. Um, I just don't think that's important. Um, yeah. But sorry, that, that might be no, that's, hopefully not a harsh opinion, but with, with exactly that said, right. yeah. I, I, I do think when we first opened Gary Forkham was the owner of Forks mm-hmm. and I heard a lot of things, you know, I've, I've met Gary a few times, but I heard a lot of things that like Gary's, very kind, very helpful, very relationship built, built business, which I think is fantastic. That's why I started my business. And so I think I already had a lot of similarities to Gary. So I never felt like, oh, this guy is going to be after me or try to shut me down. So when we opened, he definitely came over and he checked this out. And he's like, oh, you, you do mainly vintage drums. I'm like, yeah, that's that's what I'm really passionate about. And he's like, oh, me too. I love vintage drums. And but his shop, like Forks, was always it's always it was known for like you know any and every modern piece of gear you can get mm-hmm. like they had everything it's really a beautiful shop um and where my shop was way more of a, a niche type of thing especially at the time when i was very small um out of andy's thing yeah. and uh through that yeah he was super cool and then it was it was great there was never anything ever that popped up that was slightly weird or uncomfortable um i think he knew i, I was staying in my lane and that that's the lane that I wanted to stay in. I didn't really have any interest in trying to like become a DW dealer or any of these things. Not to say that they're bad. These are all great drums. It's just like what I really yeah. care about. Um, that's what I thing. wanted to. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so no, he, he was amazing. He was very supportive. And we talked over that couple of years a couple of different times on the phone. And Gary was just, he was, I couldn't say anything nicer about that man. He's really built his business in a really beautiful way. I think, um, but anyway, he, he retired and he sold his, business to Steve Maxwell. Mm-hmm. And uh, when Steve started running it, uh, we, we became friends pretty quickly. I and mean, I didn't really know Steve. I obviously knew Steve's name and I've met him once or twice, but you know, he was big legendary vintage guy forever. Um, and so we became friends just through after he bought Forks. Uh, he started coming over and we kind of bonded just through having the same passion. Yeah. I've met Steve a few times um, at different drum shows and he's just extremely knowledgeable and passionate, like you said, and and I hope to have him on the show at some point soon. But um, so I also wanted to talk about um, you had some social media posts recently that were kind of a break from, you know, drums, and you were really opening up about some stuff that had been happening in your personal life, including your um, your health, which uh, I think was really cool that you did that. But uh, yeah, what's talk about that a little bit. When when my health issues started kicking up, uh, I started to see a, a counselor for it, just like just to mentally be on top of it, you know, cause I was my like really quickly, my, when, I mean, when you're this young, you, you feel a little bit indestructible, you know? So I, yeah. I never thought I would have serious health issues. And so f- for this stuff to, and when this was unraveling, it was kind of like a year and a half, two years of me and my wife trying to figure out what was going on. And long story short, I, I've had a lot of breathing issues hmm. with my, with my lungs. Um, and it, it turns out it's like, it's connected to my heart when I was young. I had heart surgeries when I was young. Wow. I, I didn't, think anything of it because I was totally fine sure. all up until this last like two years. And I guess from that specific surgery I had, it's somewhat common to like develop uh, lung issues later in life because your heart is still overworking, uh, which is kind of like it was just wearing out my lungs. So anyway, with that, they they were trying to figure out what was causing it and they couldn't figure it out. So it was kind of a stressful time. So I was seeing a counselor through this to kind of just like mentally be on top of it. And um, and it's it's been great. They found out what it is and, and things are actually working really great which for a season it did kind of feel a little bit hopeless like man my health is getting worse and worse and they were talking about like a lung transplant if it got oh even worse God. and so i was like oh my gosh this is so scary you know um yeah and i was i was more so even just afraid for my child and my wife I was like man i of course. i like i i need to take care of these people like what am i gonna do if something were to happen to me and anyway things have kind of changed like okay we got a solution this is working everything has been uphill which has been beautiful this last you know six months or so they they figured out how to work on this and it's been great. I think that, you know, having a young kid sometimes when you're in these tough positions and it kind of sounds like you were kind of pushed. I don't know. It's different too. When you've got 
you got a lot of stress. I mean, to be honest, like rent and new businesses and, and you have a kid and it's just like sometimes that there's a it's different than being a 24 year old or whatever. And you're just kind of like, you know, floating through. You got responsibilities, man. Totally, man. It's 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 crazy. I mean, I it is the most beautiful gift on the planet. Like I love I love my child. Best gift ever, really. Like and my wife's incredible. And the Trump community, I love this drum community. So it's all things that I, I love. It's not like I'm, I'm uh, burdened at all by like, oh man, there's so much to do and there's so much stress from all this stuff and, and my health going bad. Like it was just that, it was just that it was a lot, even though it's all good things. Um, yeah. You have a lot more exciting stuff on the horizon, you know, obviously with your new shop and everything. Um, so you can, you can put it behind you, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the original whole idea that was to kind of me letting go even like every one of those things was away from me you know like my health and all these things was a way for me to like release some of this out to the world and and for whatever reason i felt like i owed it to people to tell them where i was um because i did i had a sense of guilt that i was away from my shop for so long you know and, and nobody really knew why and i like with my health and everything going on i just felt like i was um I was like, man, if this if this whole thing is really honestly about community, then I need to open up to these people that have been my friends. They're like, they're not just customers. These people are my friends. They're my family. So I feel like I need to let them know what's going on. I know that sounds so weird. This is not like the typical business talk, which is why I... No, it's it's know, different but, for everyone. And honestly, I think I like... Hopefully people listening to this, I think it's cool to have a um, just a different talk um, that's that's more about, like you said, the community, which, man, you've, you've over the, the run of your shop... Um, I think you've made some really good friends with very big popular drummers and, and drum makers. And I think that's pretty, that's pretty cool. It's just like a, uh, um, I don't know. I I've, I've had something similar with a lot of these old, like, you know, collectors who are twice more than twice my age where we still like, we just all share this love of drums and we talk on the phone and stuff like that. And just, oh, can, yeah, and, and it's global. It's not just like, you know, come into the shop and talk. I'm sure, um, that's the beauty of all this is it's just putting yourself out there and being friends with people and making friends and talking. Um, but, uh, yeah, you've, you, you seem to have, have, uh, really found yourself to be good friends with a lot of, you know, Aaron Sterling and these, these famous drummers. It's, that's gotta be pretty oh. cool. Yeah, it's very cool. And I mean, all those people are just so, you know, I, I think I had a different, you have a different idea before meeting a lot of your drum heroes, yeah. you know, like what they might be like. And, and the ones I'm very close with, I mean, they're just such wonderful people. I mean, really like Aaron, Aaron is really, really an incredible person and really funny, very intentional, you know, all the things that you kind of hope your heroes will be. Um, and Jay, I mean, Jay's the most like intentional person you, you'd ever meet. Just like, it, it's just kind of, it's kind of surreal feeling like, man, these people are just real people. You know, you just, you have a different idea before in your head, like, oh, you know, they're probably just so busy. They probably like get people coming up to him all the time with different things, which is true. Yeah. Um, but it's just cool to see him be like real people, you know? Yeah, totally. Now. Um, all right. So we should throw in a little bit of talk about drums here because, uh, sure. why not? <laughs> sure. You know, it's a drum podcast. So, uh, yeah. in your experience here and your background and your hunting and all this stuff, um, I mean, I, like I've seen Mike Johnston talk about, you know, he's gotten some awesome snares from you and stuff and just, just all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. Maybe, you know, a couple of your favorite um, personal or whatever thing you, you didn't have to find it personally, but in your shop, some of your top, like this is like holy grail drums that have come through or like really cool barn finds where it was oh, sure, sure. buried under something and it's new old stock. Yeah. What's, what's some cool stuff like that, man? I, um, there's been quite a few that have, that have been really special to me, you know, um, usually the, the drums I've kept have been smaller things that were gifts that, that felt sentimental from some drummer that you get to me with some like tambourine or most of those are the things I've kept because they feel like there's a, a more sentimental aspect to, to me. I've, I've never been too tied to gear. I, I do like when something's new, I get really excited about it. Mm -hmm. thing, I walk into my shop and I'll see a drum I didn't see before that an employee pulled in or something. I'm like, Oh man, that's very cool. It's super exciting, but I, I don't have too much of an attachment to it. So like, I don't usually feel like, okay, I need to put the money in to bring this home. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the, the ones that like were gifts from other people, those ones really mean a lot to me. Um, sure. uh, so most of the drums I have are like that, but there, with that said, there is, um, I, I didn't have a place to play drums for three years outside the shop. 
So me and my wife were in a one bedroom apartment and then we lived in a tiny home uh, after that for like a year. So we did the two years in the apartment, then a year there. So I didn't have a place to set up drums at home and playing drums at work always seemed, uh, it was always tough for me because I, I felt like one, there was always like an employee there or somebody there. Yeah, I get it. Um, and if it was before hours, I had to like help set up whatever or get things ready. So I, I never felt like it was easy to play drums at work. But anyway, I, I've always wanted a, uh, a conical trick song kit for whatever reason, those have just always been so appealing to me. Just, totally. I was a huge, or I am a huge James Brown fan and not that they always used conical drums, but that's kind of how I figured out about Vox and tricks on drums when I was younger. And for whatever reason, those, those conical drums really spoke to me. So I, I got one a couple years ago and I bought it for myself. Um, and this is when I had, when I was living in the apartment and it was just staying at the drum shop. It was just in the corner of the drum shop and had a little not for sale sign. And then um, Matt Chamberlain was hanging out at my shop one day. We we're just hanging out and catching up. And he's like, man, he's like, is there any way I could buy that conical kit? And Matt's been a really, uh, really generous and kind friend. Um, and so I, I just wanted him to have it after that. I was like, well, you know, it's, I could find another one. Like I'll, I'll be able to find another one. So I, I, I sold it to Matt which he left in the studio in Nashville, him and uh, this guy named Eric Massey. That's a really great engineer producer out here. Uh, and it stays at his place here. And then when Matt comes to town, he just plays in that kit. Um, but when I sold that kit, I thought I'd be able to find one fairly quickly. It took me like another two years uh, <laughs> to find that kit. So yeah. I finally found it. And I literally just set it up like three weeks ago. That's awesome. we, we just bought a house. Um, I, I don't even know how many months ago that was maybe six, seven months ago. And there's a tiny, 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 like an oversized closet. It's not even really like a, you couldn't really call it a room. <laughs> yeah. But just like this very small room, oversized closet. Um, I put the kid in there and it's been the first time I've actually really sat down and played drums for years. Like I, I would play here and there five minutes at a time at the shop or whatever, but that has been amazing to be able to experience that again. Um, and my joy for drums again, just have a place to play. But anyway, this, this was a whole about a gear question. I'm tangenting off once again. No, it, like, it, <laughs> I, I do think people relate to that though. But, or, and I'm sure industry people relate to it too, where it's like, yeah, you might work with drums and talk about drums all day, but to physically sit down, um, especially with a young kid it is, is, uh, not like a, uh, I don't know. It's not a guaranteed thing. Like sometimes it's not <laughs> as easy as you think to like find the time or the space. Um, so I'm, I'm, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been really great. But I mean, that's as far as personal gear, um, that, and I had a rolling bomber snare that I had for a long time. That cool. That was, um, I, I've had a few of those through the shop, but this one just spoke to me. So it was one I kept for a few years and then same thing. It never really got played cause I didn't really have a place to play, but it sat around and it brought its temporary happiness, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that, that rush that we get. And then we have to find yeah. something else. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but there's definitely certain, like there's definitely drums that I love, you know, like, or that I get really excited about. Like I, I love like any of the wine ripple finishes or like the Fiesta pearls or like kind of the weird wacky stuff. I always get totally really into. Um, yeah. Or if I like certain sizes, like I a big, like a, I love old jazz a lot. My, my all time favorite artist is probably Billie Holiday. Hmm. Um, and I love that era of music quite a bit. So, um, that, I mean, not, maybe not that era, but directly after that, a lot of people were using smaller size drums like Elvin and uh, Elvin Jones and a bunch of different drummers. So I, I love, I get excited about like 12, 14, 18 setups, like just smaller little jazz setups. And I feel yeah. more comfortable in those type of kits. I'm definitely a, more of a hack drummer really, but it, but, uh, but sure. those types of sizes, I usually feel more comfortable on than, you know, something else. I watch like Jay play and Jay always has these like cool, like bombastic, cool old drums that are like big and I'm like, oh man, I would love to play like that. But then I'll, I'll try to, you know, do whatever it is and it just never feels right. So <laughs> I think I just feel smaller or feel better on a smaller little kit. So usually most of the drums I have it, if I keep something, it is usually more like that 12, 14, 18, 12, 14, 20 type of setup. Yeah, which is cool. And it's kind of pocket sized and they're still just, uh, I, I like that too. But there are days where I'm like, I don't know, man, I'd love to have like four toms and two floor toms and, you know, a 24 inch bass drum or something. And it's like, but it's a lot of times in space and moving things, it's, it's not practical, but I, I love and I'm jealous again of having like, and then there's like rows of crashes and two rides and there's like a side snare. It's like, totally. It'd be awesome to have, but it's, it's just yeah. a different 
thing. Oh, it's a blast to play stuff like that. That's for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, man, this has been awesome. So, um, Bryson has been kind enough to join us on a uh, bonus episode today, which, which Bryson, I would like to ask you about your overall aesthetic. I mean, with social media, you have kind of like a very cohesive, um, your, your t-shirts, just everything. You have like a feel to you, even with your, uh, like seeing your booth at um, the Music City Drum Show, it's all very, I think, it, it seems like it comes naturally to you, but it seems very purposeful and cohesive. And I think people can learn a lot from from hearing about that because, you know, that aesthetic can go across your just genre, like into, into your music and, and just being purposeful. Um, so anyway, I'd love to hear about that if that's okay with you yeah yeah definitely just again thank you so much for being here why don't you tell i think people most people know you on social media and all that stuff but why don't you just tell people where they can uh find you and check out what you're what you're doing online yeah sure um well you can find like if you're online you can find us on nelsondrumshop.com that's our website uh we put a, a decent amount of inventory on there not not all of it but um but anything that we, we do kind of ship all over and anything we could ship out of you can reach us out by email which is hello at nelsondrumshop.com or our instagram page which is i think it's just nelson drum shop i believe um cool yeah so that's that and then as far as if you're local uh we're on the east side of nashville in east nashville specifically so uh right off riverside drive 1102 riverside drive awesome cool and i will um you know as this comes out i'm sure you'll be posting about your new shop and i'll share some stuff online just so if anyone's listening to this and then um, can, can get, you know, check out your awesome new space, which it's cool to hear that story about it. Um, so oh, thank you anyway, I guess, yeah. Um, Bryson and I are going to hop over now and do the bonus episode about the cool look and vibe of, uh, Nelson. So, um, yeah, Bryson, thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.